we looked at Satan's attack on Job's character. And we've seen a scene unfold in heaven. And it's surrounded around the Lord's servant, Job. And in verse 8, the Lord says to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil? And the Lord here is asking Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? Now remember, we've been talking about Satan's ability to be able to to attack and at times what suffering is and often looking at perhaps at not all suffering because remember the big question at least in the conversation of Job's friends is them giving answers as to why Job is suffering. And at times we see in scripture that there are ways in which we can suffer. Peter gives a couple of references as to um, how one can suffer and in 1 Peter 4 He says, you know, if we are going to suffer, may it be for Christ's sake, you know, for serving the Lord, for, you know, the Christian life. But then he says, but do not suffer because it's inevitable. It's going to happen. But do not suffer as an evildoer, a thief, a murderer or a busybody. Right. And so there's suffering that takes place because not all of it is a penalty for sin. Not all of it is a correction in righteousness. Not all of it is redemptive in itself. And not all of it is because of, you know, noble bearing of persecution for righteousness, right? Like, in other words, this is just a good person and they're being persecuted, you know. No, but then another thing that we looked at is that perhaps even in the case here of Job that... The suffering could be be very well what Paul makes reference to in Ephesians chapter 3. In Ephesians 3, in verses 10 and 11, he says that there is an element of suffering that has nothing to do with any of the lists that I've uh, mentioned. But at times, suffering also can be a part of that which happens so to be an example to principalities and powers. So sometimes what we go through has nothing to do with, uh, you know, uh, the enemy attacking us because of this or because of that. It all has to do with we need to go through this trial to be a witness to the sons of God. And sometimes that's the case in Job's case. This is how it kind of starts off. It, Paul, the apostle, also echoes the same sentiment in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 9. And he goes on to say there the very same thing for principalities. And powers. And this is why Peter, we looked at last week, when he talked about salvation, he says the angels do not understand salvation, that, that that's something that they themselves look into as well. And so we see that there is an element in the heavenly scene that when it comes to our relationship with God, it's unknown to the heavenly host. And so suffering, in a sense, can serve its purpose in that as well. And the reason why Paul mentions it twice is because I personally believe that this is what Paul was trying to get at. As he looked at his own life, he says, well, I know I'm not suffering because of sin. Not that he was sinless, but, you know, and and I know God's not trying to correct me in something. And the only conclusion that he can come to is that perhaps it's because of this. And and I believe by, by way of the Holy Spirit, revelation came to him. And that could very well be the case as to why he wrote it this way. So taking that into account, we see really the example to principalities and powers in heavenly places is the idea here. So we now transition kind of a little bit of transitioning in chapters one and two. We go from, you know, earth to heaven, then to earth and then back to heaven again. And this is kind of how the scene is unfolding in the story of Job. But but now look at verse 13 here as we just pick up and continue where we left off. It says, Now there was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. Now notice that it says here there was a day. Now I want you guys to understand that, you know, this all happened in a day. This was in a span of a few hours, okay? Now, 
This reveals this scene on earth, but what's happening right now that we're about to read is, has to do with the conversation that took place between uh, Satan and the Lord and what was taking place in heaven. Now remember, this conversation is unbeknownst to Job. He had no clue of it. So it's not like Job understands where this is coming from. Remember, when Job asks the question as to why, he doesn't get the answer, nor does he even know what the outcome is going to be. You could read the entire book. He doesn't know why he went through what he went through. But the ultimate goal of the book was not Job figuring it out. The ultimate goal of the book was because Satan said, Job will curse you. God says, "Uh uh-uh, doesn't work that way. The Lord was very confident in Job holding to his integrity. And though he, there was a lot of emotions in Job throughout the book, you'll see that he held true. But look at how it goes. The Bible says there was a day when his sons and daughters were eating. These are Job's sons and daughters. Remember, at the very start of the first five verses, we see that, that this was his family. In verse 2, it says he had seven sons and three daughters. They were born to him. So he had ten children. And the Bible says that they were there together, gathering together. And remember, uh, the Bible says that, that the family would, would gather together in a time in which they would, they would spend time together. In verse 4, it says, His sons would go and feast in their houses each on the appointed day and would send an invite to their three sisters uh, to, uh, uh, to eat and to drink with them. So we see here that in verse 13, it says, that there was a day in which this was taking place. This was a common thing. We see that there was, there, was, there was good within the family of Job. And they gathered together. And so it says here that here they are in a time in which unexpected. Okay, This was a typical day and age for them. And then it says, And a messenger came to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys feeding beside them. When the Sabians... And some would say that this perhaps are those uh, of of Sheba, the area of Arabia. And it says here, the Sabians raided them and took them away. Indeed, they have killed the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. Now you can imagine, here's the first sound of it. Now Job doesn't know this conversation has taken place in the heavenly scenes. All he knows is that the day is a day as usual, right? And so his children are there having their time in which they're feasting together. One of Job's servants comes and he comes with news. And it's not good news, it's bad news that that the oxen. Now remember, there was a good abundance of oxen. As a matter of fact, there was, according to verse 3, 500 yoke of oxen. 500 yoke of oxen and 500 female donkeys. Now look at this here. It says that... They were there in the fields together, feeding beside them. And it says that the Sabians raided, took them away. Indeed, they have killed the servants with one edge of the sword. Excuse me, with the edge of the sword. And I alone have escaped to tell you. So the 500 oxen and donkeys have been taken. They're gone. And Job's servants have been killed. And the servant says, I'm the only one that survived. And I'm here to tell you what happened. So we see at the very start of this, Satan's attack begins. Now remember that Satan only has the authority and the ability to attack because God allows him to. He had to ask for permission. We looked at this in detail last time. But notice that Job does not, you know, have the authority to do this on his own accord. And so Job attacks, or excuse me, Satan attacks, and Job now is experiencing loss And then look at while he was still speaking, while the servant was still speaking to Job, saying, I am the only one that survived. In other words, you want to process things, right? And and, and Job hasn't fully processed that, you know, he he didn't ask where they came from. He was very well aware of who the Sabians are, these 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 that would raid, you know, and, and, and take his oxen and his donkey. So Job most likely understood who they were and how they operated. But before he could process everything, and the servant was telling him, the Bible says, while he was still speaking, another also came and said, the fire of God fell from heaven. Now, this is interesting because they're assuming that this was God's act, okay? The fire from heaven 
uh, you know, fell from God, fell from heaven and burned up the sheep. Boy, look at that. Now, how many sheep were there? If you look back uh, in verse three, you'll see that there were 7,000 sheep. Okay, now that might not be a lot to you. It's not a lot to the person who's never had 7,000 sheep, but I'll tell you what, 7,000 sheep is a lot of sheep. Okay, now hold on. He hasn't finished processing that the 500 oxen, the 500 donkey, now 7,000 sheep were consumed and servants and I alone have escaped to tell you. You could imagine here Job has now, he's lost, listen to this, he's lost 7,000 sheep, 500 oxen and 500 donkeys and all his servants except for two. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, the Chaldeans, from the deserts of Arabia here, formed three bands, raided the camels, and took them away, yes, and killed the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. Hold on. Now he has three servants in front of him. He had 3,000 camels, 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 oxen, 500 donkeys, and he still hasn't processed the first 500 oxen and donkeys. Think about that for a moment. All this is happening one right after the other, and the Bible has given us insight because it says before they were even finished saying what they had to say, while they were still speaking, while the words were still in their mouth. Now listen, guys, listen, one little trial rocks us to the core, right? And then we're worried about the next one. We're like, oh, Lord, I don't, I don't want another one for a while. That doesn't work that way. But look at what happens here. He goes on to say here, while he was still speaking. You can imagine by this time, Job already knew this is not good news. I have three servants in front of me that have been spared. And all that Job had. Now remember, when we looked at all that he had, we've seen the place where Job came from, the person of Job, the family of Job, and the wealth of Job. Everything that Job possessed was gone. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, your sons and your daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And suddenly a great wind came from across the wilderness, struck the four corners of the house, and it fell on the young people, and they are dead. And I alone have escaped to tell you. Job had ten children, 500 oxen, 500 female donkeys, 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels. And in just a few moments, and you can imagine an abundance of servants dwindled down to just four servants in front of him. And everything in Job's life as he knew it was gone. It was gone. I'm reminded of what Solomon says in Ecclesiastes chapter 9 and verse 12, that no man knows when his day is going to come. That, that no man knows the time in which these things would befall us. Now, listen to this. In the context of Job's story in and of itself, Satan's attack consisted of the Sabians. And some would say, well, you know, I just want to give you guys a thought. You would say, wow, you know, Satan sent the Sabians there. I don't think it was Satan so much directly sending them. I think sometimes you got to understand, in the sense like how they said, the, the, the fire of God fell from heaven. The enemy has a tendency of perhaps creating some difficulty in our life to where he would want us to blame God. He would love to blame God for what's happened in your life. Now, it's kind of the way Satan operates. It's kind of the way it works. But, but the Sabians, I just want to give you a thought that I think is really important. It goes back to what Satan had asked the Lord. He says here, the problem with Job. So what he's saying, he says, the problem with Job is that 
you have this hedge around him. If you remove this hedge and he begins to lose these things, he says, well, well, listen, he is not going to fear you. He's going to curse you. And I think it's interesting to note that oftentimes we don't realize the protection of God upon us. It would seem to me that it wasn't so much a direct attack of Satan when the Sabians, like if he said, hey, go get Job, now's the time to go. I think that when, when, when this hedge was removed, I think the Sabians were always ready to attack. I think the Chaldeans were always there. They would have easily done what they did to all those around Job, but the reason why they didn't touch Job was because of the Lord. It had nothing to do with Satan. It had everything to do with God's protection. Because God is sovereign. He is in control. And especially in the lives of his own people, he's in control of our lives. And, you know, sometimes we, we, people like will take a natural disaster and they'll say, well, that, you know, that's God's doing. Sometimes that's just the way weather is. Though God is sovereign, we can't blame it on God. But sometimes the enemy uses that. And we see the power, the authority, and the ability that the enemy has. But in this case here, we see how important it is for us to be under the protection and the shelter of the Lord. In Job's case here, Job prospered, yes, because God protected him. God took care of him. I mean, this was something that Satan himself noticed. He says, because you've made a hedge around him and his household and all around that he has on every side, you have blessed the work of his hand and his possessions have increased in the land because you have protected him. Now that you've moved your hand of protection, look at what happens. You know, that's why I often say sometimes there are things that the Lord perhaps has protected us that we have no clue of. And when we see him face to face, we'll realize, man, that the Lord was really in the midst of a lot of things. A lot of things. So Satan's attacks consisted of these, the Sabians, the fire of God, but really it's most likely lightning, perhaps whatever it was that, that came and, and, and maybe like the fire there in um, in 1 Kings, right, in 18, where, uh, you know, Elijah's there and he's on Mount Carmel and the fire of the Lord comes down and, you know, and, and, and consumes the sacrifice in that same way. But, but here we see that the fire, we see the Chaldeans, we see this great wind. And once Satan received the permission, once God's hedge was removed, then all these things happened immediately. So in a sense, you could see that perhaps, yes, what Satan said about a hedge of protection, that in fact was true. What was not true was that's the reason why Job feared God. And so we see as all this has taken place, imagine nobody likes to hear bad news, but, but imagine all of this, all these things, your possessions is one thing, your family is another. And he says here that, that all of them died, his children, all ten. The Bible says, then Job arose and he tore his robe. Now the tearing of the robe has the idea behind it as this inner turmoil. We see this throughout the scriptures there in Genesis 37 and verse 29 and verse 34. And also in Genesis chapter 44 and verse 13. In Judges chapter 11 and verse 35. As they, as they tear their robe, it, it clearly shows that with inside there's, there's, there's pain, there's anguish, there's turmoil. And then the shaving of the head also shows really a, in a sense, personal agony and a removal of one's own glory. By the shaving of their head, the shaving of their beard... And when a person does this, they, they have nothing else left. They're, they're bare before the Lord. At least that's the picture in Isaiah chapter 15 and verse 2. In Jeremiah 48 and verse 37. And so Job's picture here is, here's Job with everything that he once knew and owned. And then his children, his very own children, his very own seed... All gone, only left with four servants. And as Job hears this news, he tears his robe. We say, okay, well that, yes, of course. He's, he's responding. But it doesn't stop there. 
He doesn't just tear his robe and say, there's so much turmoil in here, nor does he shave his head and say, you know, as I am depicting a loss of personal glory. That's what he's doing here. He does all that. And the Bible says, and he fell to the ground and worshiped. Job worshiped. You see, the word here, sakao, for worship, means to prostrate before the Lord. And that's what he did. With reverence, listen to this, the word clearly means with reverence and loyalty to God. In other words, Job's faith did not waver. Not even the emotion of loss took him off course in his trust to the Lord. Now, I'll tell you guys what, you know, we would probably have a different response, and that's okay. But, but this story here gives us, you know, some good insight as to Job's heart before the Lord. When, when God gave a description of Job, you see, the Bible says in verse 1 that Job was blameless and upright and one who feared God and shunned evil. That's really important. Well, what does that look like? And then the Lord reaffirms that when he says, Have you considered my servant Job? There's none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil. Well, what does that look like? It says it about Job. God testifies of it. Here, a man loses everything he has. Here's what it looks like. He rips, he tore his robe, he shaved his head, he fell to the ground and worshipped. He worshipped the Lord. It would be very hard for the average person. Both of these symbols of grief here is what we see. But this grieving here is not like the grieving of the heathen. The, the warning in Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 28 is when the heathen mourned or grieved in this way, they, they did something different. Here, here, Job worships the Lord. The heathen cuts themselves. They tattoo themselves. It's all for a sign of mourning and grieving. You know, it's, it's a passage people try to use for tattoos. Like, you know, Christians shouldn't get tattoos. You know, the Bible says it. Well, the context has nothing to do with you getting tattooed. I'm not, now listen, I'm not saying go get tattoos now, all right? Don't be like Pastor Dave said, we can get tattoos. Eh? Listen. I don't encourage it, okay? But you're not going to go to hell if you get a tattoo. All right? But the heathen, they grieved this way. This is the way they did. They would mutilate their bodies. And in a sense, it was treating the body as if it was their own. All Job could do, excuse me, was fall before the Lord and worship him. Job had nothing else to offer. And Job worshiped the Lord. And, and it's not so much that Job is saying, God, why? No, he is worshiping the Lord. And then notice what his thought process is. Job says this word. He says, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return there. Just, just notice, he looks back, and then he looks ahead. He looks to the time in which he was born, the understanding that he was, he was born. And he came to this world with nothing. And he knows that he's going to leave this world with nothing. Now, remember, there's a couple of things that we have said in the past. I'm trying to remember what sermon I said it in. It wasn't too long ago. But anyways, the point was, you can't take anything with you when you step into eternity. What you can take is your family. You could share the gospel with them. You could minister the word of God. Here, Job is saying, naked I came from my mother's womb. And the idea also of the mother's womb, in a sense, also, is he's talking about, you know, that, you know, we're, we're, we're from the earth. Man was created from the dust of the earth, from the clay, from the ground. And it's the same idea that from dust I came to dust I shall go. We do that at the graveside, right, of, 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 of funerals. We use the statement because that's the idea. That's what's happening. And Job is saying it kind of in the same sentiment, but he's saying it more in considering all that he's lost. Now, 
Job is not here, you know, we, we might look at this and we might think that perhaps Job is not sensitive, he's not emotional, he didn't really care. No, he does. There is great grief here and sorrow. But he's not sorrowing as someone who has no hope. There, there is something different that, that, that caused the attention for a conversation to happen in the heavenly places that earth could not understand, but, but heaven did. And that was that hopes, or Job's hope was in the Lord, and he trusted God, and that changes everything. In Job's case, what he does say is he says, well, here's what I do know. Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. In other words, Job is saying, listen, all that I had was given to me by the Lord. So we're not to say live life carelessly and be like, well, then, you know, that's why I shouldn't really hold on to the things that I have. Well, that's not what it's saying. It's saying don't live for your possessions, live for the Lord. There's nothing wrong with possessions, but when your possessions possess you, it's a whole nother story. But here what we see is, is Job is saying, listen, there is not anything that I have or didn't have in this life that it, it wasn't for God giving it to me. He says, the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. We take nothing with us. This is what Paul said in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 7. The Lord gives, the Lord takes. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. And Job says, blessed be the name of the Lord. So what did he do? He looked back. He looked ahead. And then Job looked up. It's a hard thing to say, but what Job is literally saying is, God is worthy to be praised, even in times of loss. I think when one truly understands that all that we have does come from the Lord, it's that Job understood that God was in control. He might not have understood it, but, but he submitted his trial to the Lord. That's what he did. He submitted his trial to the Lord. And oftentimes, I think, in, in certain things, you know, in order for us to get a better perspective and understanding uh, of one submitting their trials to the Lord, you know, we, we get a lot of encouragement by one who also suffered quite a bit. The New Testament is... A man by the name of Paul the Apostle. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, this is what it says here. In verse 7 it says, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. Listen to that. We are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body, that we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So then death is working in us, but life in you. You see, Paul here is, is talking about the very thing that he has perhaps endured and taken on for the sake of the gospel. You, you know, in one sense, yes, we, we love the good news and we love to share the word of God. But, but what Paul is saying here is he's saying, listen, it, it doesn't just stop there with a, with, with a cute gospel message. There's some things that come along with this. And he even goes on to say here, and since we have the same spirit of faith according to what is written... I believe that therefore I spoke, we also believe and therefore speak, knowing that he who raised up the Lord Jesus will also raise us up with Jesus and will present us with you. For all things are for your sakes, that grace having spread through the many may cause thanksgiving to abound to the glory of God. Therefore, we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man 
is being renewed day by day for our light affliction, which is but for a moment. Look at that. Is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Isn't that like a clear picture of what Job is just going through right now? What, what we're seeing, the loss in Job's life, is the things that are seen. What's not seen is this, the heavenly scene, a conversation between Satan and God. And Job doesn't know. But what Job does know is that what he's living for is not what he possesses. Job possessed something else. What did Job possess other than his wealth and his children and all that he had? Job possessed a relationship with God that, that is very unique to Job. I mean, really think about it. If here, if this is one who is a contemporary to Abraham, we talked about this in our introduction to just, just the book of Job, it goes back to this relationship that we see that is, that in a sense has so much New Testament truths to it, right? Like we see this. Well, well, we know because we've accepted Christ as our Lord and Savior. We, we have the word of God, right? But, but what did Job have? What did he have? What we do know is that Job had an understanding of who God was in that, listen to this, so it was when the days of feasting had run their course that Job would send and sanctify them and he would rise early in the morning. I mean, how do you know that? What is it? Proverbs 8, 17 says, I love those who love me and they that seek me early shall find me. Now, that proverb was written way later. But something revealed to Job that it's important to rise up early. And when you seek him, he will be found. And, and not only that, Job understood also that he can go and he can sanctify his children in the sense. Not, not that they would have a relationship, but that he could go before them. Job understood. Somebody taught Job that he needed to be the priest of his home. And that's exactly what Job was doing. He was being the priest of his home. And look at what else it goes on to say here. It says, according to the number of them all, for Job said, it may be that my sons have. Notice that he says it may be. People oftentimes say the story, well, Job's kids were bad. They were just bad, right? And he had to go and sacrifice. No, Job is saying, maybe they did. I just want to make sure. I'm going to intercede for my family. I'm going to offer up sacrifices to the Lord, and it may be that the, his sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. And who would only know that? Not Job, but God would. It's interesting how Job knew very well that God knew the thoughts and motives of the heart. I don't know. For me, I just look at this and I say, wow, Job had a real relationship with the Lord God. Sounds a lot like the Christian life, doesn't it? But we don't have that story. We have how Abraham had his encounter with the Lord, but, but, but Job we don't. What we do know is like it's already there. Could it have happened the same way that it happened with Abraham? Very possible. We can't say yes and we can't say no because it's not here. But what we do know is that the relationship was real, and the Lord even testifies of it in verse 8 when he says, Have you considered my servant Job? Job's reputation, you know, in the spiritual world, in that, you know, the eternal realm, if you will, was known by God, but it was also known by Satan. He was like, yeah, I, I know Job. You, you remember when, um, you know, the seven sons of Sceva in the book of Acts, remember when they went and they were like trying to cast demons out of people. <laughs> and they went to go and cast a demon you know, out of this demon-possessed person. And before you know it, the demon-possessed person said this. It says, Paul I know and Jesus I know. But who are you? You know, this, this whole thing, it's like we need to live our lives as Christians and worshipers of the Lord God in a way in which, you know, we have a reputation. 
Not here, but there. You know, some would say, do you have a reputation in hell? Well, in the book of Acts, it says that they said, we know who Paul is. We know who Jesus is, obviously. But who are you? And what happened? These, these, this demon-possessed man overtook all of them, whooped them. The Bible says they ran out the house naked. Can you imagine that? How, how embarrassing is that? But, but even more so, it just goes to show that Satan actually knew who Job was. It wasn't like God had to like say, hey, this one right there, that, that one there. No, he knew exactly. He goes, I know who that, that one is. That's the one that you have your hand upon. You guys understand that Satan's desire is to destroy anything that God has set his affection upon. And how do you know God set his affection upon you? Because he gave you Jesus Christ, his son, to die for your sins. So you're a target of the enemy. Oh, no, I want to serve God, but I don't want trials. I, I, I want to serve God, but I don't want to go through any. And, and listen, we think trials are just heartaches. And there's this, this side of the story of Job, you know, reading through the book of Job throughout the years as, as, you know, as a Christian has helped me and I think has helped many understand spiritual warfare. This is like the textbook right here because this is as real as it gets. I mean, uh, you know, Paul, we got a lot of good, you know, bits and pieces of Paul's life, but we got like a whole story of a man's life that was just affected by this over a period of time. We don't know how long Job's suffering was, but we do know in some cases we know that uh, it took a week for his, a little bit over a week for his friends to come and see him as he was. And we know that he suffered for several months. So the time frame we don't know. But we do know that it was over a period of time. And I think that's important. Why? Because aren't we encouraged a couple of times in the New Testament to consider the perseverance of Job? He persevered. Well, here we see once again that just kind of looking at this here, that Job understood very well. What we do know is the relationship that, that he had with the Lord, and it was a real relationship. And we see here that, that Job understood very well that all that he possessed had to do with the Lord giving it to him. When loss came in Job's life, he understood that all he could do was praise the Lord. I had nothing when I came in, and I'll have nothing when I go out. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job did not sin, nor charge God with wrong. Job won. Not chapter one, he won. Job got through the trial. Job praised when Satan thought he won. Satan lost, Job won. Jesus said life does not consist in the abundance of the things that one possesses. Luke chapter 12 and verse 15. Life does not consist in the things that one possesses. Though Job's story looked like that, like this man was very wealthy, but Job, we can see here, the heart that he had for the Lord had nothing to do with his possessions. In his very statement here, the Bible says, in all of this. Now, all of this is a lot. It really is. We read this story, and I don't think we read it with enough depth and emotion. We just read it because it's a story in the Bible. It's more than a story. This was a real man's life. And he lost it all. It's one thing when one family loses a child, but imagine a family losing all the children. You can't fathom that. I mean, what do you tell somebody that's going through that? It's hard. It, it really, really is. Loss, you know, great loss. You know, it, it's hard, but because not everybody has this mind. Not everybody has this heart, this relationship. Paul is saying later on, he's saying, listen, we, we do have this. And we can trust. He puts his treasure in earthen vessels. And Paul says, you're going to suffer. This, that was the whole purpose of him writing that in 2 Corinthians 4, as we were reading right now. And it seems that Paul's encouragement came from what he knew that he had in the Lord. And then Paul would even later write, he says, listen, I had a lot and I've lost everything. He says that. He says, I've learned to be content. 
Whether I have it all or have nothing. He says, I learned to be why? Because he was content in the Lord. In a sense, you can kind of see that this is what Job's life consisted of. And it's so true. At the end of the day, we are still saved. We have the Lord. I've often said, if all Christ Jesus came to do was just save me, uh, forgive me of my sins, he's done enough. Everything else is just, yeah, it's just because, you know, you're my favorite. <laughs> it's a blessing, anything that we have, you know, think about that. But, but look at this. So in all this, Job did not sin nor charge God with wrong. He did not sin nor charge God with wrong. In other words, Job stood against the attacks of Satan. Everything that he had was given to him by the Lord. He submitted in his trial. He submitted to it. He, he accepted it. He, you know, sometimes that's the hardest thing for, for people to understand. They want to know why they're going through the trial. Remember what I said. I, I mean, in some cases, Peter says you can understand why some trials come. He says, you know, don't, don't suffer for your own stupidity. It's basically what he's saying. It's not suffering in and of itself. It's because it's you caused this. But there are those things that happen to people that it's like, where is this coming from? And then you have those that are going to come and they're going to tell you where it's coming from. <laughs> and trust me, those become a dime a dozen. And they're there. But then the Bible says again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan also came among them to present himself before the Lord. Here we go again. Job wins. But Satan says it's not over. The Bible says he's our adversary. He's the accuser of the brethren. Jesus said he only comes to kill, to steal, and to destroy. You understand that there's someone who hates you. Hates everything that you're about. Your family, your children, your grandchildren. He hates everything about you, and it's Satan. He's your greatest adversary. And he's relentless. He doesn't stop. So they come before the Lord, and the Lord said to Satan, from where do you come? It's kind of a replay of what we read in chapter 1. He says, from to and fro on the earth, walking back and forth on it. And the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? He's like, oh, we're talking about this guy again. That there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil, listen to this, and steal. Well, this is something different than chapter 1. But he says, and steal. He holds fast to his integrity, although you incited me against him to destroy him without cause. In other words, it was Satan's cause. His desire was to destroy him. In other words, Job had won round one of warfare. He still holds fast to his integrity. So Satan answered and he, and he says, uh, you know, he answered the Lord and he said, skin for skin. Now this is where people get the idea of that this was a bet. It wasn't a bet. I don't think it's right to say that. The terminology is used that way, but it's not a bet. God doesn't bet with his children, okay? God just knows who are his. Isn't this what Paul told Timothy, that the Lord knows those who belong to him? You know, I think that that's a very powerful verse. I mean, because we, we don't have that knowledge that God has. So we come into church service, and, and especially as a minister, a pastor, whatever, we assume if we can kind of scan the crowd, and it's like, yeah, I've seen you before, I've seen you before and you before, you assume that everybody knows the Lord, right? And if you see a new person, then you go for it. You know, you preach the gospel. It's like, you got to get them in there, you know. And so, anyways, but whatever the case might be, we do that. But, you know, a lot of times, we're not seen with the eyes that the Lord sees with. And you have to understand that not all, as Jesus said in Matthew 7, who call upon my name, Lord, Lord, will inherit the kingdom of God, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. And so that kind of gives us this understanding that God truly knows those who are his. 
See, God knew that Job was his. It has nothing to do with the bet. It had everything to do with that God knew that Job would win every area of warfare. It wasn't a bet. It was the confidence that the creator had in his creation to withstand the wiles of the devil. And let me tell you something. Job withstood. That means you and I can withstand. This is why, you know, like I told you, people found out I'm going through the book of Job right away. They're like, I'm praying for you. You know, these trials, I don't, you know, I don't get that weirded out about things. But at the end of the day, I would say that this is probably a story in the Bible that Satan hates that we read. Because this is an average man that, that, you know, okay, so he had a little bit of money, (laughs) right? But we see him without his money. And what is he doing? He's still worshiping the Lord. And so he's saying he still, listen to this, he still holds fast to his integrity, although you incited me against him to destroy him without cause. Satan answered the Lord and he says, skin for skin, yes, all that a man has, he will give for his life. He's like, of course. This is the voice of the accuser. He says, hey, you know, anything to save himself really is what he's saying here. What he's saying is, this wasn't really a true act of Job's love for you. He's doing anything he could to save himself, just like any man has. Right? Abraham did the same thing. Did he not? David did the same thing when he pleaded insanity, right? To save himself. Peter did the same thing when he says, I don't know this man. This is not anything that's uncommon. This is what he's saying. He's saying, this is how Job is right here. This is what Job did. Of course, he's going he's gonna to do this. But then look at this. He says, but stretch out your hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will surely curse you to your face. <laughs> oh, boy. In other words, what is he saying? You just let me touch his material things. Let me touch him physically. And the Lord said to Satan, behold, he is in your hand. Oh, boy, but spare his life. Guys, when I read that, even my my heart, even earlier today in my studies, just like sunk. It's like, boy, I could, you know, I could imagine. Okay. When Jesus told Peter, Satan desires to sift you as wheat. It didn't just like pop in Jesus' mind, like a text message, right? No. Like this, obviously, this is kind of what happens in a scenery and a realm that is unbeknownst to us, right? So here you have Jesus and Satan. Whenever they had this conversation about Peter, we don't know. But what we do know is that Satan specifically said, I want to sift this man like wheat. And Jesus didn't say no. He's like, okay. He's like, you know, well, so what's going to happen? <laughs> He's like, I prayed that your faith would not fail. Well, why wouldn't you pray for me not to be sifted? No, you're going to be sifted. But your faith will not fail. And in the same way here, he's, he's saying, listen, you can do whatever you want to Peter. You're just not going to be able to take his faith. It's not going to fail. But do whatever you got to do. Peter was sifted. And the reason why his faith didn't fail, because we see that the position that Peter held in the beginning was a position that, and a title that that really was given to him by himself, right? He wanted to be the the right-hand man, though he was one of the three that Jesus personally discipled. He called 12 disciples, three, Peter, James, and John. But we see that Peter was like the most, like the guy that just didn't know how to shut up. He put his foot in his mouth, take it out only to put the other one in time and time again. But then what we see is that he was the first one who went to proclaim the gospel and he led 3,000 Jews to the Lord. The first one to go and proclaim the gospel as the Holy Spirit came. And we see that ultimately as, as Peter held on and Jesus restores Peter, the restoration was was greater than than, than what Peter had to begin with. And he became one of the leaders of the early church, used by God greatly. But here, in this case, he says, he's in your hand, but spare his life. So Satan went. 
out from the presence of the Lord struck Job with painful boils from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. Now, Jesus said in Luke chapter 13 and verse 17 that the woman that was sick, he said that it was a spirit of infirmity. Now, I want us to understand something because some people take this passage and they say, well, all sicknesses are Satan's attack. They're demons. And so technically, you don't need to take medicine. You need to be delivered. But in some cases, yes, they are. We do see demons that, that in the New Testament that caused those to be blind and they were delivered or mute. And in the case of the woman there in Luke 13, spirit of infirmity. In 2 Corinthians 12, verse 7, Paul talked about this pain. Remember, Paul even would go on to say, a messenger of Satan to buffet me. And a lot of people have said, well, this is what it was. It was sickness. But Paul says what it was. It was a messenger of Satan to buffet him. Paul was saying that the, that the physical, or, or excuse me, that the pain was more than physical. It, it was also spiritual, a messenger of Satan. Satan had the ability to cause pain in his life. And some would perhaps even believe, and I kind of hold this view, that it wasn't so much that, that he had, you know, this issue with his eyes. It could be that, because, I mean, you see it in the book of Acts where, where Luke then begins to now assist Paul because he was a physician. But, but I think what, what his greatest concern was after all that he went through in his life, was his concern for the church. And the messenger of Satan to buffet him could very well have been someone that was just giving him great turmoil in ministry. Because sometimes the enemy can use people. The enemy can use people. And we got to be careful with that. You can't be like, you know, you're letting Satan use you right now. No. <laughs> Some people do that. You know, I've had, I've had, you know, people come to me and like, man, I'm married to the devil, you know, and it's like, you know, why? And they try to say, you know, you don't understand. But, but no, Satan can use, I mean, we've seen it with Jesus, right? In Matthew chapter 16, Jesus says, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And then Peter says, uh, Jesus says, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And then Jesus goes on and just encourages them, upon this rock I will build my church. And then he finds it necessary now that they have all heard that I'm the Christ, right? He then begins to talk about his death. And then Peter right away stands up again. He's like, Jesus, come here. I mean, literally, that's what he did. The Bible says he rebuked him. Like, who rebukes God in human flesh? Peter. Right? And he pulls him aside and he's like, Far be it from me. In other words, I'm not going to let this happen to you. What Peter was saying is, you're not going to go to the cross because I say so. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. In a sense, Satan used Peter. You look at the life of David. When David took a census of the people, right? He caused this judgment to come upon the people and some 70,000 lives were affected and and here's David scrambling, God, forgive me, I'm sorry. David even said, Lord, take my life, take me. And the Lord says, you need to offer up to me. And we know that David then purchases a place where he's able to build an altar to the Lord. And we know the story. But if you look in First Chronicles chapter 21, it says that Satan had put it into the mind of David to take a census of the people. David didn't hear from the Lord. He heard from Satan. Satan used David in that way. He, he, he should have maybe prayed. <laughs> Whatever the case might be, he didn't. But you see how the enemy is relentless in any way that he can get in there the moment our guard is down. But I want to be careful because, you know, oftentimes, guys, listen, um, especially with people with, like, mental illnesses. You know, some people say, well... Isn't that demonic that a person has a mental illness? In some cases it is, but not in all cases. In some cases it is a chemical imbalance. And I've seen literally good Christian people that have to take medicine, medication for mental illness. And then you got those other ones that are like, no, it's, it's all demonic. Don't take your medicine. Oh, okay. They don't want them to? Well, then let them live with you without taking it. Then we'll see how quick you get them to get back on it. Right. But I'll tell you guys, I have seen a person who literally was D 
demon-possessed and a, cu a couple of times, especially traveling out of the country and going to Haiti where voodoo is their national religion for over 200 years. Literally seeing demons being casted out of people, being there praying and laying hands and seeing the very thing happen before my very eyes and see a person act totally different than what they were and even shocked. They're like, what are you doing here? Who are you? And I mean, it's mind-blowing. But in some cases, it's not. So here, in this case, Satan had the ability, and this was, the boils was warfare from Satan upon Job's body. Now, remember in Deuteronomy chapter 28 and verse 27, this was a warning to the children of Israel if they disregarded the word of the Lord. He says that I will strike you with boils like in Egypt. This is what I'll do. So it's not too far-fetched from Satan's ability to do. I mean, this was part of the cursings, if you will, of Deuteronomy 28 as well. But why would Job be under this? And why would his body experience this pain? It says here that he struck Job with painful boils from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. And he took for himself a, a, a potsherd with which to scrape himself while he sat in the midst of the ashes. Now, Job here he is with now these boils. He's just lost everything that he had. And now what Satan is saying, if he loses his health, he will surely curse you. And his wife. <laughs> Better you than me. Then his wife said to him, do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. Wow. Exactly what Satan wanted to happen. Job's wife says, curse God and die. You know, sometimes that's how some feel. I've seen people walk away from the Lord and their Christian faith because they've gone through some grave trial in their life. Satan got the victory. But if you hold on and keep your integrity, God gets the victory. Because God will use that to bring glory and honor to his name, and he will get the victory in your life, and more people will come to know the Lord and his ability to sustain and keep us. But it's having this heart of understanding, the way Job understood. Now look, I think it's important to take note that here, it's Job's wife. And remember, considering this passage when I was told, David, the only ones that can hurt you the most are the closest ones to you. Job's wife said to him, do you still hold fast to your integrity? Notice for her, she checked out. She, she, she's with the crowd that's going to come and start accusing Job of, of doing something. She's saying, just curse God. He's, in other words, for her, you, you know, in, in a sense, it kind of shows, you know, and I looked at this and I said, this is why the Bible gives specifics as to who the leader of the house is. It's, it's not even so much the story of Adam and Eve. I mean, I mean, we see that later on it says, you know, that, that, that the woman was deceived that the man should lead, that that's where the headship is. And in the same case here, you see that if, that if it would have been Job's wife that had gone through this, she would have did, in fact, hear what she said or asked Job to do. Here's an opportunity for Job to lead in integrity, even when his wife and those around him do not understand. Why do you still have faith in God? It's basically what she's saying. You know what blows my mind? When you look at all of this, you say, wow, what? How is it that all of Job, those close to him, were affected by, by this trial in his life? It's an amazing thing. We can get lost in the whole thing. With, well, what, well what, mis, you know, what issues did his kids or his cattle or all that he had, what did they have in all of this? Well, well ultimately, regardless, they weren't going to live forever. What shouldn't be the shock is that they died. Maybe a lot sooner than it was appointed for them to, but that they died shouldn't be a shock to you. 
we're all going to die. We're all going to step into eternity. And so the issue shouldn't be like, wow, I can't believe, like, you know, he let his kids, you know, they were going to die anyways. But they died soon, very soon. But notice that Job didn't say anything about that they were too young, that Job didn't say, you know, look at my servants, they were good to me, look at these cattle, none of this. And now his wife turns around and says, curse God and die. And he said to her, you speak as one of the foolish women speaks. Shall we indeed, listen to this, I love this. Shall we indeed accept good from God? And shall we not accept adversity? We, you, you just want the good in life? Is that what you want? You, you want to serve God only because things are going good? Job says we need to serve God not only in the good, and we need to serve God also in the not so good. And in all this, Job did not sin with his lips. I'll tell you what. You look at this and you see all that Job has gone through and there the loss of everything that he has and what he was known for to now even his own physical body being affected by this very thing. And I'll tell you what, in the end, what does it say here? Job did not sin with his lips. Guys, listen. Job, I would say, one round two. You know, when a person has a relationship with the Lord that is... That is like Job's relationship with the Lord that we see here. And the Lord testifies of it. He's saying there. And, and Satan is not, you know, Satan is just saying, well, the only reason why. Because really it's a direct attack not to Job. Satan doesn't even have an issue with Job. At all. His issue is with God. But because Job's love for God, the Lord is saying, well, you know, hey, he loves me. He only loves you because... My issue is with you. You take care of your children too much. Let me have Adam and let's see if they still love you. What we see here that I think is important for us to understand, guys, listen, is that we need to trust the Lord in all circumstances and situations. Sometimes the Bible says we're to be quick to listen and slow to speak. And I think that we're to be that way at all times. Don't be so quick to say why you're going through what you're going through. Persevere like Job and wait on the Lord. The encouragement here is even that those closest to Job were saying, hey, curse God and die. Just do it. You'll feel good after. No, things would have been worse. But Job, even though he was being afflicted, still had control because of who God is in Job's life. We'll